Welcome to the MIT Center for Art, Science, and Technology's 2021 Symposium, Unfolding Intelligence, the Art and Science of Contemporary Computation. CAST was established in 2012 with the goal of building and building on connections between the worlds of art, science, and technology. This is the third in a series of symposia that CAST has convened since then, and as with its predecessors, we bring together artists, scientists, engineers, and humanists from within MIT and from the world at large to discuss areas of rapidly evolving research and urgent social relevance, and to find in that dialogue stimulation, confirmation, provocation, intersection, and, we hope, common purpose. At MIT, CAS partners with departments, labs, and centers to integrate the arts across the curriculum to enrich and encourage artistic collaboration and to provide support to faculty and members of the MIT community as they pursue their own artistic practice and or research. In addition to symposia like this, CAS facilitates the sharing of this creative work beyond the Institute by producing concerts, exhibitions, and publications and making them available to the public. So thank you for being with us today. We hope you will join us throughout the week at virtual events addressing the aesthetic, technical, and critical issues pertaining to artificial intelligence and computational media. We also look forward to seeing you on Friday, April 9th, as the symposium culminates with a live interactive event to which all attendees are invited and which you can join presenters and artists in breakout rooms to explore hidden threads between all that has been discussed this week. Welcome. My name is Caroline Jones, and I'm an art historian teaching in the history theory criticism section of the Department of Architecture here at MIT. This is a pre-recorded introduction to the second of two sessions on the theme of open systems in the Unfolding Intelligence Symposium hosted by the Center for Art, Science, and Technology, known as CAST. These sessions are also supported by MIT's Transmedia Storytelling Initiative. Once again, I want to thank Mellon postdoc Will Lockett and CAST director Leela Kinney for making this symposium a reality, as well as Catherine Higgins, who served as the open systems session producer. Please feel free to ask questions at any time during the webcast. You'll also find links to other events in the symposium. Our colleagues at the List Visual Art Center have their own hosted uh, related events on artists and AI that I hope you can sign up for and attend. I want to begin my brief introduction tonight by speaking the words of MIT's recently achieved land acknowledgement. Although we gather virtually, the resources and capacities of MIT come from being a land-grant university based on the ongoing occupation and colonization of previously occupied land. MIT acknowledges indigenous peoples as the traditional stewards of this land, recognizing the enduring relationship that exists between them and their traditional territories. The land on which we gather is the traditional unceded territory of the Wampanoag Nation, among others. We acknowledge the painful history of genocide and the forced occupation of their territory, and we honor and respect the many diverse indigenous people connected to this land from time immemorial. Acknowledging the living indigenous communities here in Massachusetts is really important to me. And this evening's session opens directly onto questions of indigenous epistemologies of kinship and biological theories of mutualism that our panelists will discuss. Following their pre recorded presentations, we'll engage in a live discussion and QA. Mutualism emerges from Professor Fredrickson's biological study of entangled ecologies, while Professor Lewis argues that kinship can also be forged with our machine learning processes, potentially as proxies for other species with whom we share the planet. The way that both of them utilize computation and think about the promise of AI is the fascinating conversation I look forward to engaging them with tonight. We'll begin with Professor Fredrickson, followed by Professor Lewis. I'll then open out our discussion to your synchronous 
questions and answers. Megan Fredrickson has been engaged with the biology of social insects, plants, and their symbionts for decades. Educated at Harvard as an undergrad, she did her PhD at Stanford and runs a lab on mutualism, ecology, and evolution at the University of Toronto. Fredrickson's work on mutualism and its role in driving evolution requires that biological events be converted into data, data that might be necessary to convince remnant Darwinists obsessed with survival of the fittest, predicated on individual reproductive success, that we actually need to think about other units of evolutionary fitness and combinations of communities that evolve together. While field analysis alone might inform us about native and invasive ants as seed spreaders, for example, we need rapid throughput genomic analysis to tell us about holobionts and hologenomes in these complex plant animal societies. Megan is writing a book that aims to synthesize mutualism and microbiome research in order to better understand when and which microbes are beneficial to their hosts, including humans and how we can make the most of microbes which are everywhere on this planet. So for those at Yenisuthala's talk this morning, you'll recognize a consistent troubling of the cranial model of intelligence. That idea that a brain can be analogized to a centralized computer mainframe or motherboard with its circuits and command centers. Suthala and Fredrickson both point to the fact that there's intelligence in the microbial gut brain that we are still trying to figure out. There's also intelligence in the immune brain that learns and remembers from its encounters with vaccines and viruses. There is super organismic intelligence in the ant colony and even a kind of homeostatic intelligence in our beleaguered planetary systems. Fredrickson is building a laboratory system that wants to engage these questions quite precisely. She hopes to do massively parallel host microbe in experiments in hopes of testing the effects of thousands of microbial communities along with their mutualist symbionts. This is important. When we assess the impact of termites on the African ecology, for example, we need to reckon with the fact that these eusocial insects don't even have the capacity to digest wood in their guts without symbiotic protests carried along. They form lifelong relationships with quite different species that must evolve with them and are responsible for managing an ecosystem dependent on their activities. By naming this session Open Systems, I aimed precisely to open ideas of intelligence to this kind of questioning. The broader conversation about models of sentience and ways of knowing among and between planetary forms. Fredrickson uses genetic analysis and thinks with algorithms to trace evolutionary changes among mutualists in an ecosystem, such as a recent paper about this Caribbean plant known as the yellow alder, crucial to a particular butterfly, the tawny oster, which lays its eggs on this particular plant's leaf. The evolution of mating and reproductive systems involve all members of this mutual relationship, confronting the tendency of biologists to speak of parasites and hosts, or talk about cheaters and altruists. Fredrickson's lab offers a recent study of rhizobial bacteria genomics inside legume roots. As she will discuss in her pre-recorded presentation, she and her colleagues showed that the evolution of bacteria lines solicited by these legumes is what drives the evolutionary outcome of the mutualist system. Bacteria confer fitness on the legumes and evolve toward greater mutualism, not less. Bacteria are crucially part of the environment, which also is a partner in this dynamic. Although Fredrickson acknowledges that the classical biological definition of kinship does not allow her to call these symbiotic mutualisms of legumes and their bacteria kinship, Maybe this symposium will encourage her to persuade biology otherwise. Think how useful such a concept could be in describing a situation in which a nitrogen-starved plant sends out a chemical signal for help, growing nodules on its roots to welcome the necessary nitrogen-fixing bacteria from the environment. In one recent analysis by biochemists Marati and Condorosi, 
exchanges of signal molecules between the partners, bacteria and legume, leads to the formation of root nodules where bacteria are converted to nitrogen fixing, fixing bacterioids. In other words, the bacteria change from free dwelling in the soil to endosymbionts in their new dependency on the legume for photosynthesized nutrition. Jason Edward Lewis understands the power of such non-sanguineous kinships. He brings into this discussion an acute awareness of tech, traditional environmental knowledge in confrontation with our Western models of technocratic mastery. Tech produces an active link with the teaching of elders and ancestors, which Lewis recently celebrated in his native Hawaii, and as it is recently being reevaluated in something like the controlled burns of the California uh, high drylands. Those were originally conducted by First Peoples, dismissed by Western management techniques, and are now being resolicited to manage those fragile lands. Like Fredrickson, Lewis was also educated at Stanford, where he received a degree in symbolic systems before going to the Royal College of Arts for an MPhil degree in design. Professor Lewis is both a creative coder and a media artist. He has also been a profound mentor of generations of indigenous media theorists and artists. Professor of Computation, uh, Professor of Computation Arts and University Research Chair in Computational Media. He also runs the Initiative for Indigenous Futures from his post at Concordia University. In all these endeavors, Lewis has given us an entirely new and fruitful way of thinking about kin. Notably, in his collaborative polemic, published in MIT's own journal of design and science, Making Kin with the Machines. The authors who identify variously as Cree, Lakota, and Hawaiian hold that many different indigenous epistemologies converge on methods for making respectful relationships with minerals, microbes, and machines, as well as animals, of course giving us forms of knowing that can help us move away from the anthropocentric troubles we find ourselves in. As a scholar of Hawaiian, Cherokee, and Samoan descent himself, Lewis puts these epistemologies to work in his own creative computational poetics. I'm showing you here an excerpt from his poem, Quartet, which draws on the 2019 science fiction book by Adrian Tchaikovsky, Children of Ruin, about an octopoid intelligence on a terraformed planet. Lewis's poem segues into an imagining of a troika of AI companions based on the intelligence of the honorable octopus, put at the service of a young Hawaiian adolescent. In addition to stimulating Lewis's poetry, this Ako Akamai AI is in tune with deeply held Hawaiian concepts of responsibility and reciprocity within the ecosystem. These poems and meditations are published within a document Lewis edited in 2019 uh, and published in 2020, The Indigenous Protocol for AI, an IP for thinking about the potentials and colonizing perils of artificial intelligence. The document was the pre-COVID achievement of an extraordinary gathering of scholars and thinkers including our own esteemed colleague, D. Fox Harrell, who's running a different session in this symposium. These critical approaches to IP and AI wanna open out those systems to our scrutiny, as well as welcoming our multi-generational and multi-species imagination. In conclusion, if this morning's conversation prompted artist Diana Sutla and curator theorist Lars Bang Larsen to think about AI as alien intelligence, addressing how we might imagine potential kinds of sentience in our um, planets not yet encountered, then this evening's prompts us to think about AI as kin. Fredrickson and then Lewis will help us unfold machine intelligence as a tool for revealing mutualisms and a creative device for creating more than human alliances. Let us turn then to these amazing panelists for their open systems engaging life and machines. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Megan Fredrickson and I'm a professor of ecology and evolutionary biology 
at the University of Toronto. My talk today is entitled Animal, Plant, and Microbial Life Interconnected. So I study mutualism and symbiosis, two words that are often used interchangeably, but are not actually synonyms. So symbiosis means different species living together in close association, like corals and their microscopic photosynthetic algae or leguminous plants and the nitrogen fixing bacteria they house in root nodules or grazing mammals and their gut microbes. Mutualism in contrast means all interactions between species in which both species or all species benefit from the interaction, whether or not the species actually live together. Maybe uh, most symbioses or probably most symbioses are mutualisms, but not all mutualisms are symbiotic. So for example, plants and their pollinators are generally mutually beneficial interactions even though they don't actually live together. And mutualisms and symbioses are everywhere, all around us, all the time. These interactions make fundamental, but often underappreciated contributions to ecosystem functions that sustain biodiversity. Globally, most pollination, seed dispersal, biological nitrogen fixation, photosynthesis in coral reefs, and digestion in, mutualist, in mammalian guts happens mutualistically. Humans also have both symbionts and mutualists. We live in close association with the diverse microorganisms that colonize our bodies, especially our guts. Sometimes this community of microorganisms is called the human microbiome, which is currently a hot area of research in biology. And we can also think about the interactions that humans have with crops or with livestock as mutualisms in which both, be both species benefit. So this is my son actually picking strawberries in a farm, at a farm uh, last summer. But I don't really study humans. In fact, I don't even study vertebrates. I study plants and insects and microbes, which are far more diverse on our planet than vertebrates are. And my research aims to understand how mutualisms and symbiosis links the fate of interacting species in ecosystems and how these interconnections between species have shaped the evolution of life on Earth. So mutualism is a form of cooperation and cooperation is an extremely widespread phenomenon at all levels of biological organization. We can think of genes cooperating in genomes, organelles cooperating in cells, cells cooperating in multicellular bodies, and individuals cooperating in societies, including our own. And mutualism is just cooperation between species. It's also so widespread that most plants and animals engage in mutualism with at least one other species that they depend on for nutrition, or protection or dispersal. And I study mutualism and symbiosis in the wild, working at field stations in both the Peruvian Amazon and here in Canada and elsewhere. And I also bring insects and plants and microbes into my lab at the University of Toronto to study their traits or their behaviors or their genes in ways that would be impossible in the field. And increasingly, like many other biologists, I also use computational and bioinformatic methods to quantify patterns in larger complex data sets. I'm showing you some video of one interaction that I've studied for many years between an Amazonian plant and the ants that it feeds and houses. So each branch on this tree has a hollow swelling like the one you can see in the middle, of those leaves in the video. And if you were to cut open that hollow swelling on the branches on this tree, you would find them full of ants and their eggs and larvae. And this tree species has actually evolved to make this specialized form of housing for ants. And it also makes these tiny little food bodies, which are too small to see in the video, but it makes them to feed the ant colonies that live inside its branches. Why? Well, these ants may be small, 
but they are aggressive and have a really powerful sting. And they attack any herbivores that land on the plant, including this grasshopper that you can see in the video or what's left of it anyways. So the ants defend the plant against the plant's enemies and the plant nourishes and shelters the ants, an excellent example of cooperation between species. But cooperation is supposed to have a dark side. Cooperation in all its forms is supposed to break down because of the evolution of selfish cheating strategies. Evolutionary biologists think about a population of cooperators, which are shown here in the slide in the blue seas. And these cooperators, these blue seas, benefit others in their population at some short-term cost to themselves. But they recoup that short-term cost by also receiving benefits from other cooperators in their population. But imagine if there was a new genotype, the red D here, that arises by mutation in this population. And what, what makes the red D genotype different is that it no longer provides any benefits to the other members of the population. And it thus it saves on the short-term costs of cooperation. But the red D still receive benefits from others in the population and thus have higher fitness than the cooperators, than the blue C's, because they get all of the same benefits, but pay none of the costs. Thus, the red D is a cheater or defector genotype that is favored by natural selection, and we predict it should spread in the population. If all else is equal, which it never is, we would therefore expect that the red D genotype would spread to fixation. And we would have started with a population of cooperators, the blue C's, and ended with a population of non-cooperators, the red D's. In other words, we would expect cooperation to break down given enough time. So why do we still observe cooperation in all its glorious forms throughout nature? How cooperation evolves and is maintained in nature, despite the threat of selfish cheating, is a question with a very long history in evolutionary biology. And I'm not really gonna have time in my 15 minute talk today to do it justice. But very briefly, we have known for a long time that this puzzle is solved if the donor and the recipient of the cooperation are related, meaning they share genes. The British geneticist, JBS Haldane, is said to have remarked that he would not give up his own life to save one brother, but he would lay down his life for two brothers or eight cousins. Why? Because in humans, siblings share on average half their genes and first cousins share on average an eighth. The idea that cooperation, evolve, that cooperation can evolve if it's directed at relatives or kin was further form formalized by W.D. Hamilton in 1964 in a pair of foundational papers. And it's still one of the leading explanations for how cooperation evolves between individuals of the same species for example, in bees and ants and other insects that live in colonies, as well as in humans. But it doesn't work for mutualisms. Mutualisms, by definition, occur between members of different species and are thus not kin. Thus, Hamilton's explanation for the evolution of cooperation, which is often known as kin selection, cannot explain the evolution of mutualism. Nonetheless, Mutualism and symbiosis clearly evolve and persist in nature. They're all over the place when we look around the natural world. And my research has repeatedly shown that mutualism, oh, sorry, that cheating does not threaten mutualism evolution. I wrote an opinion article a few years ago entitled, Mutualisms Are Not on the Verge of Breakdown, arguing that despite a lot of attention to the cheater problem, we rarely actually see cheaters in nature. And there is little evidence that mutualisms break down into parasitisms over evolutionary time. In short, mutualisms don't go over to the dark side. Moreover, there are reasons to think that the evolution of mutualism and symbiosis actually generates new life forms and new functions that can lead to ecological and evolutionary success. So to give just one example, the eukaryotic cell is the product of an ancient symbiosis. And of course, this new kind of cell gave rise to all the plants and animals and fungi that are on the planet today. 
As Lynn Margulis and Dorian Sagan once wrote, life did not take over the globe by combat, but by networking. So I want to briefly describe one recent research project from my lab to give you the flavor of the kind of work that I do, and also to convince you that cooperation can evolve easily and fast. So this project involves the legume rhizobium symbiosis uh, shown in cartoon form on this slide. Leguminous plants, including many that you are familiar with like soybeans, have symbiotic bacteria called rhizobia that live inside nodules on their roots. Those little uh, uh, circles on the roots are the nodules that house these symbiotic bacteria. And all plants need nitrogen, uh, and there's lots and lots of nitrogen in the air, but uh, it's in a form that plants can't use for growth. But rhizobia and some other bacteria are capable of doing something really special. They can take at, uh, nitrogen from the air and turn it into plant accessible forms, a process called nitrogen fixation. And of course, of course, plants can do something special that a lot of bacteria can't do, and that is they can photosynthesize and they can take carbon dioxide from the air and turn it into sugar, which bacteria also need. So legumes and rhizobia form a symbiosis in which they exchange plant-fixed carbon and bacteria-fixed nitrogen to their mutual benefit. This is economically and ecologically important because there are many crops and forage plants that are symbiotic legumes, and because biological nitrogen fixation done by bacteria is really critical to nutrient cycling in ecosystems. So in my lab, uh, we've done a lot of work on how in the wild, there's lots of variation among rhizobia in how much nitrogen they can fix and how much they help their plants grow. And we wanted to find out whether we could evolve better symbionts in the lab. So we took rhizobia and added them to sterile plants and allowed them to grow. And when the plants got big enough, we cut off the above ground plant parts, so the leaves and the stems, and let the roots die and re-release bacteria into the soil. Then we planted another seed of the same type of plant and repeated this process five times in a greenhouse experiment lasting about a year. We used five different plant genotypes. You can think of plant genotypes as different varieties of the same species of plant, always giving the bacteria a new seed of the same plant type. And at the end of the experiment, we isolated and cultured the microbes, uh, tested them on new host plants, and then measured how many nodules they formed and how much they helped plants to grow. So this is what the experiment looked like in the greenhouse with bacteria evolving in those um, pots of soil beneath all those little legumes. And this is what we found. So each one of these panels labeled with a number across the top is a different plant genotype or variety. And we tested the bacteria at the end of the experiment, both on the plant genotype that they evolved on in the greenhouse experiment and on all the other kinds of plant genotypes, which they hadn't seen during their year long evolution in the greenhouse. And that's indicated on the x-axis as whether the bacteria shared evolutionary history with their host. So the left-hand panel shows how much the bacteria helped plants to grow, how large the plants grew with different kinds of bacteria. And the right-hand panel shows how many nodules those bacteria formed on plants. And what I, can hope, what I hope you can see is that in general, bacteria formed more nodules and made plants grow bigger when they had evolved with that planet plant genotype for a year. So the microbes got better at cooperating with plants. They became better mutualists, but only with the hosts they were paired with during the year-long evolution experiment. So I've just shown you that we can evolve uh, better symbionts in the lab. We can make microbes that are more cooperative with their hosts. And one current big idea in the field is that it might be possible to evolve or engineer microbial symbionts for a wide range of beneficial purposes. Be those applications in health or in agriculture or in biodiversity conservation. Maybe we can design microbial strains or communities that improve human or, or ecosystem health or well being. But the main problem is that microbes are not, in fact, machines. They are living organisms that do not just stay where you put them. They do not necessarily work in predictable ways or as the designer intended. They disperse, they jump from one host to another, and they evolve. So I think the jury is still out on whether evolving or engineering microbiomes will really work as some have envisioned. 
So what does this all mean for artificial intelligence? I haven't really said much about AI today, and I am no AI expert. But I will say this, in my area of biology, we often think about microbes um, behaving according to simple algorithms and evolving and interacting in tiny experimental microcosms as just one step removed from a simulation model running on a computer. Microbes in the lab add only a little bit of realism above what happens in silico, and they are still a far cry from the complexity of real natural ecosystems. So in my lab, we spend a lot of time thinking about what conditions and designs select for cooperation among beings that don't share genes, and when, if ever, we would expect to see the evolution of selfishness or cheating. And this seems like also a worthwhile question to ponder as humans design and create ever more intelligent machines. And with that, I'd like to acknowledge the people, institutions, and funders that have supported my recent research, and I look forward to the discussion. Hello, everybody. I want to start by thanking the organizers for inviting me to this panel and to Dr. Jones in particular for moderating and bringing uh, Megan and I together for preliminary conversation. I am speaking from Joe Jage, known in settler Canada as Montreal, on the traditional territory of the Ganya Gahaga Nation. I want to preface these brief comments by noting that as I use the term Indigenous, I'm talking specifically of a North American, Pacific Islander, and Australia and New Zealand context. And I want to underline that I'm not here to speak on behalf of any Indigenous peoples, but rather to report on the work that my Indigenous colleagues and I have been doing. So today I'm going to talk about the work of the Indigenous Protocol and Artificial Intelligence Working Group. For me, that story starts with Making Kin with the Machines, an article I co-wrote in 2018 with three colleagues, uh, Noah Lani Arista, a historian who was based at the University of Hawaii at the time, Archer Pachowis, a Cree performance artist who's based in Toronto, and Suzanne Kite, a Lakota a PhD candidate who works with me. Our goal was to try to understand what artificial intelligence might mean within our particular Indigenous context. In the essay, we write, we believe that Indigenous epistemologies are much better at respectfully accommodating the non-human we retain a sense of community that is articulated through complex kin networks anchored in specific territories, genealogies, and protocols. Ultimately, our goal is that we, as a species, figure out how to treat these new non-human kin respectfully and reciprocally. One way to think about this is to understand that each of our cultures, Hawaiian, Cree, and Lakota, when confronted with a new entity, ask first, how are you related to me, rather than what is that? That is true for other humans, certainly, but also animals, stones, mountains, and oceans. That first question illustrates a view of the world that sees all encounters through a relational lens first, even before essence, and certainly before utility. How each of our cultures articulates that relationality is expressed through protocol. In other words, the procedures for recognizing and maintaining those relationships. Protocol is very important within our cultures as it guides us in how to live a good life. For instance, Hawaiians understand themselves as links in a genealogical chain that places us in a kinship relationship with the ocean and the creatures of sea and land. As Dr. Arista writes, Kanaka Maoli ontologies make it difficult and outright unrewarding to reduce pono, or balance, to a measure of one, to prioritize the benefit of indiv individuals over relationships. Healthy and fruitful balance requires multiplicity and a willingness to continually think in and through relation, even when, perhaps particularly when, engaging with those different from ourselves. A Kanaka Mali approach to understanding AI might seek to attend to the power or mana that is exchanged and shared between AI and humans. In attending to questions of mana, I emphasize our preference for reciprocity and relationship building that take the pono, here meaning good or benefit, take the pono of those in relation into consideration. Uh, Cree people situate everything in a circle of relationships, as Mr. Pachalis writes. In Cree epistemology, relationship is paramount. Nehiawin, or Plains Cree language, divides everything into two primary categories, animate and inanimate. One is not better than the other. They are merely different states of being. These categories are flexible. Certain toys are inanimate until a child is playing with them. 
during which time they are animate. A record player is considered animate while a record, radio, or television set is inanimate. But animate or inanimate, all things have a place in our circle of kinship or Wakotawin. Stones exemplify the complex set of protocols that govern how the Lakota approach kinship with the non-human. Ms. Kite writes, Standing Cloud, or Bill Stover, communicates Lakota ethics and ontology through speaking about the interiority of stones. These ancestors that I have in my hand are going to speak through me so that you will understand the things that they see happening in this world and the things that they know to help all people. Stones are considered ancestors. Stones actively speak. Stones speak through and to humans. Stones see and know. Most importantly, stones want to help. The agency of stones connects directly to the question of AI, as AI is formed not only from code, but from the materials of the earth. To remove the concept of AI from its materiality is to sever this connection. In forming a relationship to AI, we form a relationship to the minds and the stones. If all things might potentially be a relation, this certainly includes the tools we make. In the field of AI, we are crafting systems whose goal is to be human-like in intelligence, to which we are giving agency we have previously only given to humans, which are being used to assess human behavior, and in some cases make judgments about that behavior, and which, on the outside edge of the science fiction dream, may achieve some form of sentience, maybe even consciousness. These are systems in which we already are in relation, and that relationship is only going to grow and become more complex as the technology advances. Indigenous cultures have tools, languages, protocols, and epistemologies that remain robust in articulating these types of relationships. As the Making Kin with the Machines essay was being written, I worked with two other colleagues, Angie Abdilla, a Troll Woolway designer based in Sydney, and O.E.V. Parker Jones, a Hawaiian neuroscientist working at Oxford. We put together two workshops in the winter and spring of 2019. These are called the Indigenous Protocol and AI Workshops, and they are attended by 35 participants, with representation from 15 Indigenous communities from across Aotearoa, Australia, North America, and the Pacific. One of the Unfolding Intelligences organizers, Dr. Fox Harrell, and his graduate student, Danielle Olson, were among those who joined us to lend their good minds. The group included neuroscientists, cultural knowledge holders, computer scientists, poets, language keepers, visual artists, hula teachers, venture capitalists, historians, software engineers, language keepers, and others. The workshop conversation covered extensive ground, including epistemology, cultural protocols, machine learning, colonization, temporal models, ontology, sentience versus consciousness, software architectures, and linguistics. Out of those conversations came the Indigenous Protocol and AI Position paper, which we published in July of 2020. Indigenous epistemologies generally approach the discovery, refinement, transmission, and preservation of knowledge as inherently multidisciplinary. As such, the position paper features artistic excursions as well as analytical essays, and poetry as well as profiles of prototypes built during the workshops. Here's a small sampling. Suzanne Kite, mentioned previously, wrote a chapter called How to Build Anything Ethically. She examines the protocol her people, the Lakota, used to build sweat lodges in order to develop a methodology for building computational systems in a good way. Michelle Brown is another PhD student who works for us from the University of Hawaii at Manoa. She wrote a chapter on how she imagines her indigenous Basque community harness, harnessing AI to support them in their relationships with the ocean. Given the centrality of the eel to her culture, she designed the technology to mimic eel behavior, creating the Chicharden ocean-going AI relative. One of my contributions is to imagine a young Hawaiian growing up alongside three different AI systems. One is modeled after process-oriented indigenous languages, such as Blackfoot, as described by Leroy Little Bear. One takes its foundation in Hawaiian epistemologies of abundance. And the third uses the neural architecture of an octopus to translate between the first two and advise the youth. We also had a project that prototyped a piece of indigenous design language translation software. Noe Arista, Caroline Running Wolf, Michael Running Wolf, Caleb Moses, and Joel Davidson worked together to create Hua Ki'i, an app that allows you to use your camera phone to look at objects in your environment and get community verified Hawaiian language descriptions of them. 
And Dr. Hemi Wanga wrote about the potential for AI systems and related technologies to be used against indigenous peoples as an extension of colonial practices of exploitation, extraction, and control, particularly those that displace a people's understanding of themselves with a worldview that favors the colonizer. He writes, the colonization of the culture, language, and mind takes place through the transmission of mental habits and contents by means of social systems other than the colonial structure. These social systems include cultural practices, language, and technologies such as artificial intelligence. We also develop guidelines for Indigenous-centered AI design to reflect in condensed form the themes and concerns that we found most important. I want to highlight several of those themes. Relationality and its consequence, reciprocity, are the core of humanness and are how we produce knowledge that is worth knowing. AI systems should be designed to understand how humans and non-humans are related to and interdependent on each other. Understanding, supporting, formalizing, and encoding these relationships is a primary design goal. Indigenous knowledge is often rooted in specific territories. AI systems should be designed hyperlocally, meaning in partnership with specific Indigenous communities, and should be responsible to those communities, provide relevant support, and be accountable to those communities first and foremost. And finally, all AI systems should be designed to respect and support data sovereignty. Indigenous communities must control how their data is solicited, collected, analyzed, and operationalized. They decide when to protect it and when to share it, where the cultural intellectual property rights reside, or if they even want to deal with that sort of framework, and to whom those rights adhere. So I want to close with two provocations that grow out of this work. The AI industrial complex doesn't have an ethics problem. It has an epistemology problem. The persistent infections of bias are simply symptoms of this deeper issue. The epistemology problem stems from a series of assumptions that are built into how we design and deploy our computational systems. The user is an individual. The individual is primarily concerned with maximizing their personal well-being. Culture is a second order affect rather than the primary phenomenon and that the only useful knowledge is that produced through rational instrumentality. This makes AI system engineers blind to important aspects of human existence, such as trust, care, and community, that are fundamental to how human intelligence actually operates. The refusal to engage, explore, and operationalize knowledge frameworks that centralize these aspects is a tremendous scientific failing, creating huge gaps between what humans think of as an intelligent presence in the world and what the industry academic complex is building. This to me is the cause of white, the white supremacy that social and computer scientists such as Noble, Benjamin, Gebru, and Bulawini have documented. The bias in these systems is not a bug, but rather a feature of an interlocking set of knowledge systems designed over centuries to privilege white men. We need to be clear about this. Furthermore, I have to wonder if machine learning, deep learning, and all the different AI techniques that rely on vast amounts of data to work are not fundamentally ethically compromised. Very little of that data was collected in a truly ethical manner. The people who produced that data were not asked if it be used this way. They were not compensated for this use, and the use most likely does not benefit them directly. Indigenous people have a long history with people like this. Scientists who behave as if our data is a publicly available resource that they can use to make themselves famous or wealthy or powerful, all in the name of the greater good of increasing humanity's store of knowledge. Indigenous folks see people like that coming a mile away and recognize them for what they are, colonizers. AI system builders who do not understand the cultures in which they operate cannot understand how their systems actually perform. As scientists, they should be ashamed at how narrow-minded they are. As engineers, they should be embarrassed at how badly their technology fits their use case. We should expect more from them. In the meanwhile, my colleagues and I will continue building capacity within our communities so that we can design and build AI systems ourselves that are better suited to helping our particular communities thrive. Ones that look beyond impoverished models of intelligence to develop ones that are based on abundance. Thank you. I am looking forward to the conversation.